this saved for you and just give our official welcome to our webinar, Understanding the Big Picture, What We Know About Strong Program Design. And with that, I'd like to introduce Kobe Langley from the Corporation for National and Community Service. He's going to give us our official welcome and say hello for the corporation. Kobe? Thanks. This is um, uh, a really a really pleasure to, to be on this webinar today. I think this webinar uh, marks a, a sea change in terms of participation levels, um, you know, for our webinar series. This is marks uh, actually the 12th webinar we've done so far in less than a year uh, that um, connect our programs, uh, our program officers, our grantees, and our nonprofit and, and state and federal partners. <laughs> it's a long list. Um, that are interested in this space. And when I say this space, what I'm talking about is uh, the veteran and military family, national service and volunteerism space. We have a number of, um, uh, of, uh, of in, important people to thank, um, you know, for that. I definitely do want to thank Education Northwest, um, you know, for hosting this, uh, these series webinars. I definitely want to thank um, uh, Marge Legowski, uh, uh, who's been a formative partner in this training series over the past year and has really, um, really helped kind of form and shape uh, the training and technical assistance that we do at the corporate level for uh, our veteran military family grantees and partners. Um, so over 200 uh, on, on this webinar, I think that's fantastic. Uh, so far to date, uh, we've had uh, over uh, 1,500 um, participants in our series, in our 12 series of webinars um, over the course of the year. So that represents an increasing interest and, um, and an important audience uh, that we continue to share our best practices with because ultimately that's what we're here for. Uh, we're here to do what we can at the corporate level and then push information out out into a field and to our partners so that they can then, uh, you know, leverage, leverage this information to, uh, um, you know, to the, uh, to the greatest extent possible. Um, uh, with, with that being said, I know there's some new people on the call, so I do just briefly want to talk uh, about the corporation's work in this space and then move right into our best, in, into uh, the study. So um, for folks new, new, to, new to this call, uh, the Corporation for National Community Service was authorized in 2009 to expand services for veterans and military family members. Um, it was expected to, to work in, uh, in nine uh, specific impact areas. Uh, those impact areas can generally be bucketed into three categories. Um, that's uh, behavioral health, excuse me, wellness, uh, education, and employment. And I'll briefly describe what, what, each, one of those, uh, what each one of those means in terms of our, uh, our grant making work. So in the case of wellness, for instance, uh, we have grantees uh, that are providing peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, behavioral health supportive services uh, for, for veterans and military family members. Uh, through the AmeriCorps grant. Uh, we also have senior Corps members uh, that do um, uh, a peer, uh, peer mentoring and uh, supportive services at VA hospitals around the country. Uh, in the education space, we have grantees that are um, providing, uh, again, peer support counseling services to student veterans. So these are veterans that are, uh, and military family members that are assisting veterans in college, uh, better utilize the GI Bill benefits, um, uh, tutor those those, uh, those individuals and assist them in reintegrating in the college campus environment, which is significantly different than the environment from which they came. Um, and in the employment space, we have, uh, we have uh, AmeriCorps VISTA members uh, that are working in, 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 alongside with uh, senior Corps members, uh, along with Department of Labor, providing uh, counseling and supportive services to transitioning service members in uh, several different states around the country. So um, those are the kinds of the activities that, that we're involved in and our grantees are involved in. Um, and like I said, most of them are aligned along those three impact areas. Uh, that's not by accident, that's by design for the folks that are, um, you know, true uh, students of the social service support network and a nonprofit uh, supported that network. Um, those three areas will, will be, uh, uh, will be um, uh, not, will be not unfamiliar to you. So with that being said, uh, over the past uh, three years, the corporation has vastly expanded its, its grantee work in this space. Uh, we've funded uh, over 240 nonprofits last year alone working in the veteran military family space, and, and we're currently located in over 400 communities um, around the country doing this work. Uh, last year also um, marked a sea change in terms of the number of individuals and in, uh, working uh, in the veteran military family space. If folks were able to listen to the, the uh, CEO and the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee um, last week, they'll note that over 27,000 veterans um, served last year in both AmeriCorps and Senior Corps, and we've had over 2,500 
um, uh, individual national service members working in the veteran military family space. Uh, so a huge footprint. We're, we continue to grow. That being said, um, we have a lot of space to grow, and it sounds like that's a lot. We have grown um, over a thousand percent actually in the past three years alone uh, in the supportive services that we provide, um, you know, to our grantees in the veteran military family space, and that's a huge increase. Um, but uh, there's we have plenty of space to grow. When I say we have plenty of space to grow, what I mean is um, uh, the CEO uh, is um, is looking forward to uh, increased investments over the next uh, year or so and uh, and into the foreseeable future. Each one of the program directors for AmeriCorps, AmeriCorps Vista, uh, Senior Corps, AmeriCorps NCCC have uh, expressed their own interest in continuing uh, to grow in this space and, and continue continue to grow their investments in this space. Um, so I want to encourage the grantees that are on the line. I want to encourage the nonprofit partners that are on the line, as well as our federal and uh, and state partners on the line, uh, to continue to look at national and community service as a viable solution for veter for the veteran and military family community uh, to uh, have formative impact on the lives of veteran and military family members who are serving themselves as AmeriCorps members and as senior corps members. Um, the Westat study that we're going to talk about today is actually just one piece of a number of research efforts that we've undertaken over the past year to help capture some of these best practices in the field and to share some of those best practices with, with the field uh, as, a, as, um, as a part of an overarching goal to uh, expand the knowledge of the effective practices in this area. So this is actually the first in a series of four webinars about what we know so far about veterans and military family mo members in the National Service Programming Arena. And the West Stat Assessment, um, is uh, is the principal focus of, of this particular uh, this webinar, um, and the sources for uh, for the series of webinars of the four include the Westat field assessment analysis of successful and unsuccessful grantees. Um, it includes uh, individual dialogues with veteran and military family AmeriCorps uh, learning cohort members, and these are individuals that are active participants in the uh, uh, in our uh, online knowledge network. And it also includes just anecdotal evidence from uh, uh, from you, the program directors uh, in particular, and just conversations that we've had over the past year about what works and what doesn't work uh, in terms of program design and uh, and grant applications. Um, so importantly, uh, this is uh, the, the Westat study uh, act, um, really is what I would call kind of the backbone of a lot of what we know. Uh, the Westat study was uh, was a project that was funded last year. Um, you know, through uh, through uh, the corporation's national national budget and focused uh, in this impact area, uh, and it, it took a long time. It took about six to nine months to get the study done, but they did an incredible job of talking with uh, over a hundred actually um, grantees in the space. That includes our senior corps grantees, our AmeriCorps state and national grantees, um, and our AmeriCorps uh, Vista grantees, and some uh, a couple of AmeriCorps in um, C individuals. Um, and uh, they captured uh, what I would call emerging and best practices. Um, we don't have a lot of outcomes, unfortunately, uh, to share with you today, but what we do have uh, with you is a lot of information about program design uh, and effectiveness and what I would call emerging practices. Um, so with that, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time uh, talking today. I do really want to get through, through to the study. Um, so I want to, again, you know, thank uh, our team here and uh, turn it uh, immediately over to Cynthia Robbins, who will talk about uh, the study. So, uh, Cynthia, uh, with no further ado, if you'd um, go ahead and jump on in here and start talking about, uh, or excuse me, I uh, apologize for that. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Margie. Margie is going to talk about the, out, the intended outcomes from this webinar, and then we'll turn it over to Cynthia Robbins to talk about the actual study and, and the review of, the, of 100 of our grantees. Margie? Great. Thank you so much, Kobe. I, I first of all want to let you know that of the folks who are on the call, most are AmeriCorps program grantees or subgrantees or projects and programs, and but the next largest group would be our um, senior core programs, and then our Vista sponsors and Vista themselves, and then some of our local counterparts, so the folks who are, we are working beside in our local communities. So we have a really wide range of folks, and we're delighted that they're all with us today. As Kobe mentioned, this is the first in a series of four, and it's the big picture, the overview. And as a result of today's webinar, what we'd like you to leave with is a, a sense of where your program or project fits into the overall national service landscape at this point in time as we know it. We want you to be able to apply some of these strong, promising practices that you're going to hear about and some of these design elements. And we also want you to add to your toolbox of strategies that you can use going forward in the future. 
The, the, the webinars that will follow on from this are kind of like breakout sessions at a conference. They're going to unpack some of the specific elements of identifying uh, local needs versus national needs, looking at measuring uh, success and outcomes, and then using an evidence base in this particular area. So this is the big picture stuff, and then we're going to move in future webinars into more specific ones. There were a couple of folks responded to the forum, the Knowledge Network uh, dialogue section, with some questions that they'd like to have answered during the course of this webinar. So Kobe has those questions, and as we move through, he'll be answering them and interjecting. You'll hear my voice as we go through, because although most of this uh, webinar today features the WESTAP study findings. There are some parallel findings from our analysis of successful and unsuccessful applications that I'd like to point out as we go through. So with us, let's go right now to Cindy Robbins, who is with the WESTAC group. Cynthia? Great. Thank you, Margie. Thank you, Kobe, as well, and, and the Northwest folks. I um, appreciate you all having me on today. Um, so yes, WESTAP, um, took on the study about a year and a half ago. It took us approximately a year to complete the work. Um, and this was really an initial foray into trying to understand what was happening in, in the field around engaging veterans and military family members in national service. As Kobe mentioned, the, uh, the Serve America Act of 2009 not only reauthorized CNCS, but it established veterans and military families uh, as a priority area for the agency with a primary focus on transitioning the population back into the civilian life. The folks who were coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan or her, whose family members had, had been dealing with deployed service members, um, the real focus was on embracing these folks and, and, and bringing them back into the community where they could bring their strengths and, and skills to, to contribute to the community in, in different ways. So um, one of the folks I, as we'll say, was um, engaging these uh, veterans and family members uh, in volunteer service bringing them in as national service participants or as community volunteers with the programs, or alternatively providing services that they might need to transition back into civilian life. So programs and projects might actually provide the services and we need to engage the population as a service recipient. And so we were looking for uh, organizations that had applied for grants and received grants and that were really focused on uh, engaging this population um, in, in concert with the Serve America Act. Again, baseline field assessment, a lot of this stuff is, uh, we did the interviews um, last summer through fall, so very new in a lot of senses for these programs, so it's, it is truly a baseline, as Kobe said, we're just learning kind of what's going on out there. Uh, we wanted to collect information uh, for a baseline, I'm sorry, for a congressional report. Uh, obviously, TNCF has to go back to Congress and say, here's what we did in response to this act, and so it was providing information for that. And then, as, uh, as here, uh, identifying te training technical assistance needs. Uh, there is a lot of room to grow, and we were hoping to get some ideas from the field that um, we could share with all of you, and then start to identify some of these um, promising, interesting, um, compelling practices. Not a lot of evidence yet, but some things that we heard about that look really interesting and that are worth talking about some more in these seminars. So um, next slide, please. So what we, I'll go through this quickly, but we received a list of programs um, that through the applications or through discussions at the corporation, um, folks said, you know, I think they really are engaging with uh, veterans and military family members in some regard. And these are, you know, Senior Corps, AmeriCorps State and National, and AmeriCorps VISTA. Uh, we received a group of about 180 applications or um, uh, quarterly reports. Um, to look at, to go through, to read, um, and decide if folks are really making what we've said here a substantial or strategic investment in uh, engaging this population in national service. What we were trying to avoid were, were applications where we found veterans, military family members just written in passing, um, but we were looking for concerted efforts to engage this population as a, as a new approach um, for the organization. So. Um, that was our real focus. We called those down to about uh, about 100, I believe, sent them back to the program offices and said, what do you all think? Do we get the right ones? In some cases, they said, you know, this program is so new, they're not there yet, um, but we know of another program that you guys missed. So we added a few more sites and subgrantees. And if you go to the next slide, 
this was our study sample. We actually had one more program as the actual sample is 99, um, but we had 98 uh, programs that we programs and projects that we identified that had made a substantial investment in the population, and that we included in the study as part of the interview process. And so this is how it broke out um, across the board. We do have a group there in purple at the bottom, five Vista AmeriCorps grantees. These were uh, organizations that had both Vista and AmeriCorps State National Grants. So many of these were large uh, national level organizations, but that's how we broke out across the board. Next slide. Uh, we conducted in-depth telephone interviews. We had a structured protocol. I know there's a couple hundred people on the on the webinar today. Some of you may have um, received calls from us and participated in the interview and contributed your ideas to the study. Um, there's a list of interview topics. As you can see, it's really a broad brush. We're trying to understand baseline information about why folks um, decided to engage the population uh, in national service. We also had several organizations that were focused on um, veterans and military family members all along and that decided to go for a national service grant. And so we've got kind of both folks coming in from different, different angles uh, working with the population. So we wanted to understand what was the interest in, in this area. Uh, service areas, we we're really referring to the Serve America Act and which content areas uh, organizations are focusing on. And then we have as a third bullet recruitment of veterans and military family members into national service positions. Actually, there were two, two thoughts on that. One was recruiting them into national service positions. The other was engaging the population as service recipients. So there's actually two, a two-fold thing happening there. And then the last three bullets are really sort of uh, organizational assessment. Um, what were folks doing to see if uh, what services they were offering were working, how well they were working, what had they done that they thought was working really well, and what additional assistance do people need? Um, as as you'll hear um, as we go along, that technical assistance needs, it's a new area, and a lot of folks were asking for some support and assistance uh, just to hear from, a, hear from each other, hear what was working well for other folks, and to share some ideas. So um, if you're looking for technical assistance support, these webinars, I think, are, are the right place. You're, you're in, in the, a lot of folks need some support here, and we've got some ideas about what might work. So, um, next slide. So our key findings. Next slide. All right, the history of involvement. Um, that first bullet is actually really important. Out of the 98 organizations that we, that we interviewed, um, half of them had already been engaging veterans and military family members prior to the Serve America Act. What we wrote here, though, was that a lot of that was incidental engagement, i.e. it was not specifically in response to the Serve America Act, but um, a couple things showed up that were, that were um, kind of common denominators, if you will. One was with the RSVP programs and the foster grandparents programs, almost I think every one of them said we absolutely have veterans or military family members who are working as community volunteers or national service participants. That's actually not surprising. It's a cohort effect. We're dealing with a population over the age of 55 where we've got Vietnam and Korea era, Korean War era veterans, um, family members, spouses, um, and also World War II era veterans. Um, so that's the population that a lot of those folks were in the service, and they're now serving as volunteers uh, with national service. So that was a, a very common finding um, just based on the cohort. We also found a lot of organizations that were in communities that were either near or that housed a military installation. Those uh, communities have a large active duty military population as well as a large veterans population. And so they had engaged uh, veterans and military families simply by um, accident of geography, if you will. Um, we were interested in a lot of the lessons that they could provide to us, but um, it was um, slightly different than some of these organizations that was new for the first time, reaching out to a population they'd never engaged with before. So that's the second half, was um, really a, a brand new um, population for a lot of these grantees. What a lot of them said was that they had been aware of an emerging need in their communities because of returning service members, because of uh, families dealing with family members coming back from deployment. Um, they weren't always sure how they were going to provide those supports or how they were going to engage the population. Uh, after the Serve America Act, when CNCS put a priority on working with the population, they said, you know what, the funding was absolutely critical. 
So we went for it. We've been able to address a critical need in our community, and so the timing was just perfect. So um, that was a, a key finding um, for us was that about half these organizations brand new to working in this arena. Next slide, please. Um, Kobe, I don't know if you if you want to review this again. You had mentioned it briefly, but with the with the uh, Venn diagram here, did you want to talk a little more about um, the Serve America Act issue areas and how they overlap? Sure. Uh, so as I mentioned in, uh, very briefly in my opening comments, this is just a visualization of uh, the policy focus areas that the corporation is funding in this space and how they're currently aligned with uh, the, um, the the buckets of, of the, the key uh, social service need areas uh, for veterans and military family members. So if folks here are familiar with a uh, white paper by the Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staff that was published in 2009 called The Sea of Goodwill, as well as a study that was published by Civic Enterprises in 2009 on volunteerism and national service and the impact of volunteerism on veterans and military families, these buckets will be very familiar to you. Uh, the need areas were defined as areas where local-based communities could provide uh, solutions or gap uh, services to veteran and, and military family communities in three principal bucket areas, employment, education, and wellness, or, or health. Um, and uh, the, in, inside of each one of those, you'll see um, the kind of sub-elements, and these are actually the specified, defined activities in the Serve America Act. So you start in the big bucket areas where uh, subject matter experts that work in this space have identified the need, uh, and then you move into the circles and you'll see where the Serve America Act has asked the corporation to focus on kind of subcomponents of those needs. So employment talks about um, things like employment services, counseling, certification, skills translation, disaster preparedness. You're talking about things like uh, working in conservation corps, on fire trails, uh, doing uh, responding to uh, to disasters um, with uh, you know with with veteran oriented disaster response teams um, that that work for conservation corps and, and um, uh, other nonprofit organizations. If you move over to education, they're talking about youth mentoring. These are things like foster grandparent um, uh, uh, tutoring and mentoring programs, as well as uh, mentoring and tutoring that goes on with uh, AmeriCorps nonprofits like Teach for America. Um, and education certification, uh, again, we're talking about things like, um, you know, uh, the Washington State Veterans Corps uh, or the uh, Illinois Campus Compact Program or others that work uh, in this space um, to uh, improve services for colleges, or excuse me, uh, improve services for veterans who are utilized in the post-9-11 GI Bill benefit, uh, which represents the largest influx of veterans into post-secondary education uh, since World War II. Uh, move over to health, you were talking about transportation, things very simple um, but, but impactful, uh, like senior, like RSVP members driving uh, veterans to medical appointments in rural areas, wellness and other support services, um, like I mentioned before, uh, behavioral health support services, uh, but we also have grantees doing something very new, like caregiver support services. Um, uh, that also is something that senior core members have been doing for quite a, a long time for veterans. Uh, but now we also have a very large formative national service grantee uh, that is providing respite care services for caregivers uh, of veterans and access to benefits. And this is really about um, uh, counseling service members like AmeriCorps VISTA members working in Virginia uh, to stand up um, uh, outreach, uh, coordinate activities, uh, outreach activities with uh, social service nonprofits um, who are driving veterans to uh, state, local, and federal benefits and resources. Um, and then ideally you would hope that, that uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, the, uh, uh, all of these activities align with national service specifically as a delivery model, um, not, because, not because these are things that, that we need individuals to do, uh, but more specifically that we need national service members and volunteers to do um, uh, because these are opportunities for uh, national service members to, excuse me, veterans themselves to serve uh, as well as serve uh, the veteran military family community. Um, and then community coordination, which is kind of a key component and characteristic of national service that's unique as a solution, national service and volunteerism that's unique as a solution in this, in this, uh, uh, in these issue areas. Great, thank you. Um, next slide, please. All right, so, so what we did when we talked to the, uh, talked to the interviewees and they told us the kinds of areas they were working in, um, we did ask what areas in National uh, Serve America Act areas they were working in, and this was the, as, as Kobe just mentioned, the three areas that are critical to national service. They were actually in, um, enfolded into the Serve America Act, um, 
but are just integral to what national service is about. First is services to veterans and military family members. As we said, um, a lot of services are being offered by national service programs, and veterans and military family members can be engaged as service recipients. That was pretty even up across the board. Um, the largest was creating volunteer opportunities for veterans and military family members. And uh, again, the largest area in which all um, of our 98 programs, 58 of them said they were actually creating opportunities for folks to come in either as national service participants or as community volunteers um, to, to support the community in, in what it needed. And then the last piece, community coordination, which was something that came, it actually is not included in the Serve America Act, but it was something that came from the interviews and that we learned from talking with folks, um, particularly VISTAs, as you can see there, that um, bringing the community together, finding who's providing what services and who's working together to meet the needs of the population is, is really um, core to what VISTA is about. And so you can see that um, they're the largest uh, group represented in the community coordination component of that. Next slide, please. All right, so if we look at the other Serve America Act issue areas, and I just color-coded these based on the Venn diagram that Kobe had up um, previously. Uh, employment uh, is in the blue, wellness or health is in the green, and then uh, education there in the purple. And this is how it broke out. It's, obviously, it's not going to add up to 98. Um, we had a lot of overlap in terms of uh, organizations serving in different areas. And so we, we marked across the board where, where they were meeting the needs. Um, the largest is wellness and other support services. And we'll take a look at that in a minute, because that breaks down into several subcomponents um, that are important to look at. And disaster preparedness, the smallest. Um, again, Conservation Corps type programs, uh, that area. but. All in all, when you look at the Serve America Act issue areas that were called out, the content areas, the needs that were identified for the population, you can see that of the 98 programs that we interviewed, um, with the exception of disaster preparedness, at least 18 organizations were addressing one or more of the, the needs of the veterans and military family population. So um, a pretty impressive expanse, I think, of, of services being offered and areas being addressed. Next slide. So wellness and other support services, and we said, you know, that's, that's a large uh, block in the previous diagram, but we broke that out into different components because there are a lot of different areas that were included in that, and it was kind of a catch-all within the Serve America Act, uh, so we wanted to see what was happening there. Uh, the largest area that was being addressed was housing, as you can see there, um, with AmeriCorps and VISTA being represented the most in, in that. but. Um, we know that veterans um, as a population are overrepresented in the homeless, among people who are homeless. And so this is a, a critical need for the population that is being addressed by 27 of these organizations. The morale boosting activities was interesting. That's primarily senior corps, as you can see from the diagram there. But it was really critical things like um, what we called friendly visiting. Um, uh, senior corps members going and visiting uh, veterans who were institutionalized, either at the VA hospital or assisted living facilities, or they might have been homebound. But just paying visits and, and socializing, providing supports that way, um, providing community celebrations um, at Veterans Day, maybe having a meal where the veterans and the families could come and, and share some time together, and even grave decorating ceremonies on uh, important holidays. So very important activities that were important to the community at large, not just the veterans population. Senior Corps strongly represented in that area. And then two others, behavioral health supports, which included mental health services, referrals to mental health services, um, substance abuse support groups, things like that. And then legal assistance uh, was another actually fairly well represented area, again, evenly divided between AmeriCorps and VISTA, but providing support for things like um, from tax issues to small legal issues, uh, and even including some folks that were dealing with veterans who were um, coming off, um, coming out of jail and on probation or parole. So a, a pretty wide range of services that fall under that, that, um, that area. Next slide, please. And I want to show you how this broke out by program, because you can start to see the characteristics of, of the CNCS programs once you look at this division here. Um, senior core programs, as you see, are, are strongly represented in that wellness area, the green area. Um, 
particularly impressive transportation services. Again, um, it's something people don't think about a lot, but when you're dealing with rural areas where transportation to a, a, a VA center for services may be difficult, uh, senior corps members were providing a really critical service in this area across the board. Um, and they said it's not just the transportation, but the social. Having a veteran drive another veteran to the appointment was making a big difference for folks. So a very important service. Uh, we discussed wellness and other support services, and then access to benefits, which we'll talk about a little more, but making sure that uh, individuals who had a service-related disability um, actually could get the compensation that they needed. It was just a, it's an involved process, and sometimes people need support getting there. So senior core folks were strongly represented in that area. Next slide. AmeriCorps programs, um, again, pretty characteristic of what AmeriCorps is about, um, providing supports for employment. That's the largest, obviously, um, largest bar in that particular chart. Um, and then if you go over to the far right with education and certification, uh, another very critical area for AmeriCorps members to be providing supports for folks. Um, and so strong representation there. Um, also highly represented in wellness and access to benefits, but I think the two ends of that spectrum are, are very characteristic of AmeriCorps. Next slide. And then VISTA projects by issue area. Uh, also employment, education, certification, um, and then youth mentoring. I think they had the highest representation in youth mentoring. Um, that's actually an interesting area because a lot of it had to do with mentoring military youth, but an additional component was service members providing mentoring to low-income youth in the community. So again, service members giving back to their communities in, in different ways. Um, and this is strongly represented there. Okay, next slide. So um, really the heart of the matter, we've got folks working in a whole bunch of different areas providing strong supports across the array of Serve America Act issue areas. What we wanted to find out was how are you doing it? What's working well? Um, what takeaway lessons can others who want to work in this area, um, you know, what can you learn from that and, and try to employ in your own programs? And so I'm going to back and forth and march a little bit here, but the first one that we heard from folks was creating a strong local military partnership. Um, one of the things that we heard uh, pretty clearly was that the military, uh, as a rule, will, um, there's a strong connection, an esprit de corps. Um, that, that keeps military folks um, working with other military-affiliated individuals. What civilian organizations that wanted to engage with the veterans population said they did that worked the best was actively reaching out to local military leadership or organizations for partnering opportunities. What they said is the military's not coming to look for us. They don't know who we are. Um, we have to be active and extend a hand to them. And they would reach out through um, often through the VISTAs, but not always, but they would arrange job, uh, job fairs or fairs for service providers to come together and talk about uh, who was offering what services to the community, where they were located, what the eligibility requirements are. And so they were, there was, um, once you had that partnership established, uh, folks were describing a really uh, fairly robust program that was moving along, but it was that creating that initial engagement required uh, actively reaching out, um, attending military events like a stand down for individuals homeless, uh, things like that. Um, Margie, anything you want to add in there from your uh, review of yeah, applications? Sure. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it, it, the interesting thing with the analysis of the applications, both successful and unsuccessful, is that the findings parallel what we've learned from experience and anecdotes, as well as this wonderful work of Westat. This, this first one and the second one, actually, the, the three of them kind of on this page go together, especially those first two, because it's almost a chicken or egg thing. You know, developing a local uh, partnership in a sense requires you to have a sense of who is doing this work in your community, who are the people you should talk to, and how do you speak with them, and what are the language, what's, what's the culture, and what is the vocabulary that will resonate with this group. And so in some cases, it's a, it was a matter of people, it, maybe there's a vet on your staff, or there's a vet who's one of your uh, members, or maybe your spouse is a vet, or you yourself are a vet. It's kind of working your networks 
and what we have found is if you if you can understand the culture and recognize that within the military culture there's an emphasis on hierarchy and team-based work, um, mission-driven work and making a significant difference as, as well as the assets, the wonderful skills that come with our veterans and military families, um, it goes a long way to starting the conversation. I wanted to mention at this point that those of you who have been part of the series before probably know that we've had some webinars on military competency for civilians and we've also had some webinars on developing a partnership between the military and civilian populations. These are have been recorded and are on the Knowledge Network and I want to mention that to you uh, because we will keep going back to those concepts but they are themes that emerged immediately uh, with our grantees when we first started work in this area is who do I talk to, what do I say, how do I say it, how do I find them. So the answers to those questions um, you, can, you can find from each other, from Kobe who is our resource, our subject matter expert and also from some of the work that's been done by the AmeriCorps cohort which is all found on the Knowledge Network. And again, knowing those things leads you to be able to better identify what your local needs are as opposed to quoting from a national study. Okay, does that make sense? And back to you, Cindy. Great, and, and I appreciate your pointing that out as well. That um, you've got, we have multiple sources of information reinforcing these concepts. Um, the competency piece, I don't think, can be understated. It's not like picking up a book and just getting the terms down. It really is engaging with the population, um, uh, active learning, active listening. Uh, we talked to folks who had um, extensive trainings for their civilian members uh, to make sure they understood the. Um, not, the, not necessarily the issues associated with combat, but for a, a military family, having someone be deployed overseas, whether to a combat arena or not, what that's like for the family, what it's like for the kids. Um, and just recognizing that within any group that shares a particular experience, that that shared experience has credibility. And so folks were saying, you know, the competency can come through trainings or it can come through engaging a service member to be part of your outreach team. Um, that they know the unspoken needs of other service members and so they can be just as critical in establishing the credibility of your organization to work with the veteran and military family population. Um, I also put in a bullet on effectiveness because I think that came up in particular in relation to uh, providing access to benefits. Um, military benefits are their own kettle of fish, if you will, very complicated, very bureaucratic process that um, not everybody can navigate easily, whether a veteran or a civilian. And so we talked to some programs that actually had very extensive trainings for their uh, volunteers prior to a volunteer ever talking to a veteran about benefits and, and applying for benefits. There's one organization we spoke with whose um, their, their lead for the particular program had developed a 200-page training manual and all RSVP volunteers had to go through 20 to 25 hours of training prior to actually starting to work with veterans to help them apply for service-related disability benefits or other things. They were ex described themselves as being extremely effective um, and, and very credible because they knew how to navigate the system. We also talked to another organization that um, I, I guess assumed that folks, could, their AmeriCorps members could pick this up on the fly. And they said, you know, that was a mistake. We should have given them more training. They haven't been very good at doing this. We need to, to give them a little more understanding of the difficulties of this uh, bureaucracy. And, um, and so we had, you know, both, both sides of that coin. They were very well trained who understood how to na navigate and, and those who just, it's not that easy to pick up. And so I think um, in order to be an effective program, that competency piece is, is really critical um, and can't be understated at all. And then this and last piece, identifying local. Yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. I was just going to say, if you all have in your programs uh, strategies that you've used for bridging that gap between the civilian military community or training materials, you know, we do have a place on our Knowledge Network where you can post them. Or if you have some suggestions, please do put them in the chat because folks are reading the chat and commenting as we go through this. So we're still collecting examples of strategies and you know, it, there's no one size that fits all, so your examples are very, very valuable to us. Thanks, Cindy. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, the third bullet, identifying local needs. Um, I just want to harken back to something that Margie had said earlier about, and maybe Kobe had said this, I'm sorry, that um, identifying 
you know, people use a lot of needs assessments to identify national level issues uh, and concerns, housing, um, employment, whatever. But the local needs, um, CNCS work is at the local level. And to be an effective program, you want to identify what you can do locally and where the needs are locally. And so what we've what we found by talking with folks is that while your needs are with the potentially with the veteran and military family population, um, you also have a large civilian service provider community that's trying to engage that population. And so by working together, by creating that partnership, understanding the population and the service provider population, uh, you can start to know what the needs are for your veteran and military family members in your community, what services already exist um, by bringing folks together, and then as an organization where you might be able to to jump in and fill a gap. that. Um, it may not be something you've always done, but it may be where the greatest need is. And so coming together to um, create a map for your community and conduct a needs assessment for your community, I think, is, is something that we heard was really critical to um, being an effective program. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. and. I'm going to, again, back and forth with Margie a little bit, because here's where your technical training and assistance comes in. Use what works. Um, one of the things that we discovered was uh, a lot of folks said, you know, what we're doing is great. It works really well. And we said, what program, what did you model it after? You know, what evidence base do you have? And they said, um, we don't. We just know it works. Um, more and more, we're finding that funders, not just CNCS, but veterans organizations, mental health organizations, funders want to know that the organizations are providing uh, services or engaging a population with a proven strategy, something that has data behind it that says, this is effective if it's done this way in this particular setting. And so one of the things that, that we wanted to emphasize as a, as a finding, <laughs> a null finding, is that there's not a lot of use of the evidence base, but there is some evidence out there. And so uh, reaching for a, a service strategy that you know works um, gets your program off to, to a really good start, as opposed to trying to figure it out as you go along. Um, Margie, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think that you're right on target. Thanks. OK. Um, and then the next step. I mean, if you haven't selected an evidence-based practice, maybe what you're doing really does work well. Uh, again, what we tended to find from talking with folks is that they had a lot of anecdotal evidence. Um, they had a lot of people telling them, this is making a huge difference in my life. Um, but funders want to see the numbers. Funders want to see that an uh, uh, individual who went through an employment program has more skills at the end of the program than he or she had at the beginning and that he or she is employed six months down the pike. And so assessing if you made a difference um, is not just about counting the number of people that you serve or the number, number of um, veterans or military family members you engage as national service participants, but understanding how what you provided to them made a difference for them over time. And so um, understanding uh, how to do an assessment, understanding how to measure outcomes for your service population uh, is something that I know the webinars are going to, and, and the corporation is going to continue to address. But learning how to, to do it in a cost-effective way, because I know the, you know a lot of you guys are working with small organizations, you don't have a lot of staff or funding, but there are ways to um, to do outcome assessments that won't cost you a lot of money, but that can demonstrate uh, not just for funders how well you're doing, but if you as a as a program manager need to make some adjustments, some of course corrections, those data can help you identify those things that need to change and how. So um, really, really critical to start to think about how you want to do that in your programs. Um, in addition, particularly for the veteran and military families um, component, is being able to identify them specifically out of all the folks. Um, and so you know, to include a, a marker in your data that um, this, is a, this is a veteran that we engaged in this employment service. Um, something very critical that we did not find a lot of organizations um, yet had the capacity to do. Um, and then the last bullet, uh, again, 
you always want to be able to to make mid course corrections to to move along for years, see how you're doing, and make adjustments. And if if things aren't going the way you had hoped, uh, if you have the data, go back, try it again, figure out what what went wrong, where you can make a change, and move forward. We did talk to several programs that said, you know what, we gave this particular youth program a first shot, didn't work so well, but we listened to the kids, we found out what they really wanted. Next year when we do it, we're going to do it this way. And you know, it gives them an opportunity to um, make some adjustments and move forward. It's always a learning process. Um, you're not necessarily going to get it right the first time, but if you have the data, you can figure that out, make the appropriate adjustments, and, and continue to strive towards uh, effectiveness and, and really strong outcomes for your service recipients. Um, Thank you, Cindy. Mm -hmm. I'd like to just mention at this point, or ask you guys who are on the line here listening to this webinar, if, does any of this sound familiar to you as being areas of challenge for yourself or programs that you've worked with? If so, would you be willing to just click on the check mark that's above the chat box so we can get a sense of how, um, whether this resonates with you, whether these seem to be the kinds of things that you've struggled with or whether they're the things that uh, programs you know or work with have struggled with. And, and while you're doing that, so again, there's a little check mark next to the hand that goes up, and this is in the section right above the chat where you'll see all the participant names listed. What I'd like to do is, is give you a little bit of a recap of what we learned from um, analyzing the successful and unsuccessful applications. And, and this, I think, applies across all program areas at the National uh, Corporation for National and Community Service Funds. There's lessons to be learned for all of us here. And the very first point is that a strong veteran military family uh, program is, first of all, a strong national service program. If you keep all of those important elements of program design in balance and just tweak them for this population, you will have a strong program design. It's kind of like when you work with schools. Or if you start if you go to the doctors, you know there's a different vocabulary, there's a different point of access. You need to kind of um, work your way in gently if you're going to start a new job. You know there are all lessons to be learned from our lives and from our other programming work that we can take into the veterans and military family space. So again, a strong veteran and military family national service program is first of all a strong national service program. The weak areas that we saw were often the weak in other, for other service focus areas. So the, the areas that people struggled with in the veteran and military family space were, were the areas that folks struggled with, whether they were doing education or economic development or the environment. And in particular, those challenges included um, identifying and using outcomes rather than outputs, um, identifying a local need versus a kind of global sweep and some of that has to do with um, if you're obviously a national direct or a national organization with different sites in different states, um, kind of providing rationale or explaining why it is you're focusing in a particular area and what, if you have a strong logic model, if you have any kind of reason for doing what you're doing, where you're doing it. So again, people struggle with identifying um, a local need using uh, outcomes effectively and finding and using an evidence base. And as a result of that, we've, been, we've designed uh, a follow-on. We're going to unpack each of those areas for veterans and military family programs uh, during the month of May and the month of June. So what I'd like to just uh, do a little bit of an infomercial here because we know that identifying the local needs can be a challenge no matter who you're serving or what you're doing. But we want to take a, a look at it from the perspective of veterans and military families. And we'll do that in our very next webinar, which is going to be on May 16th. Then we're going to look at the uh, identifying success or figuring out if you're successful, measuring your performance and your outcomes. And then after that, we're going to take a look at the um, finding and using an evidence base for your program. So all of the things that have uh, come up through these studies and these analyses, we're going to try to address through some of the training and technical assistance that we provide through the Knowledge Network. As you did this time, we'll be posting uh, questions 
our topics on the discussion forums on the network. And if you have particular questions that you want us to address, pop them in there and we'll make sure we do address them during the course of the webinars. Okay, so I want to reassure you that a lot of the challenges that we have in this area are challenges for anybody who is a grantee. And there are, that being said, there are some areas in particular that we need to focus on and that probably of all of them would be the knowledge of military culture and the sort of awareness of um, who to call, what to say, um, and where to find people. Okay, so that, that I just wanted to wrap up with those comments. Um, Kobe, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the national initiatives that we work with in terms of VISTA, Senior Corps, and AmeriCorps? Sure. Um, so, so uh, I think I think I, I talked about some of the some of the you know some of the emerging and best practices in the program areas. Um, I, I would say that that probably one of the most important things to keep in mind, and instead of just kind of going down our grocery list, um, and I sent you all a, a link if you look on your right hand side about some of the programs that were put together by some of your peers actually, um, and some of those were were a part of the study and some of them were not. Um, but I think it shows um, what I would say is an important assessment of what works from the field. And um, I, I do want to end, um, or not end, but um, I, I do want to focus on that because a lot of this information uh, in terms of what works and what doesn't work is going to come from you. It's going to come from the community. Um, That's right. And uh, a, great, a great number of the grantees that work in this space have learned basically by doing. And um, not everything is going to fit for every community. So. Uh, the the grantees that work the best are those grantees that um, that take the time to either do that needs based assessment in their community, or who work very very closely with veteran service organizations, either chartered congressionally chartered veteran service organizations, or even some non chartered veteran service organizations. And you can find those at va.gov, um, who have taken the time to uh, to identify the needs in their local community and become a part of that community. And I think that's an important lesson learned um, from uh, not only the study but also from your peers is that because national service as a solution hasn't typically focused on veterans and military family members, um, we aren't seen initially as a resource or as a solution in the community. Uh, so an, an important part of that is getting to know the community leaders in the veteran and military family space in your community, becoming a part of that dialogue and that discussion, attending their meetings. Uh, and then understanding their needs, and then coming to them and saying, listen, we have this resource available to you, uh, an AmeriCorps member or a senior corps member that can assist you in meeting your needs. Let's talk together about how we can formulate a program to do that. And those are, uh, that, that's probably one of the largest, or excuse me, one of the, one of the clearest lessons learned in the study, and that is programs that succeed are programs uh, that become an active part of the veteran and military family community by reaching out to and becoming partners with veteran serving organizations or veteran military family serving organizations inside of their community. Those are definitely the ones um, uh, who, are, who are most successful and that's, uh, you know, it, it's important to, um, you know, to know your space and, and become a subject matter expert in your space and to gain that knowledge by working with partners uh, who do that on a daily basis and in some cases have been doing it for decades, uh, if not over a century, uh, for some of the, the chartered veteran service organizations. So. Um, uh, and instead of going down a grocery list, I would, I would just say that that's probably uh, the best lesson learned here, um, you know, from the study. There are a lot, there's a lot of information here. You guys will all be able to access it and look at it. Uh, and there's a lot of program models to look at and, and focus on. Um, but you, you're going to be successful uh, if, you, uh, if you stick to the community resources uh, and, and experts, um, you know, locally, and then build a national service solution around those needs. Great. Thank you, Kobe. And I think it's important for folks to recognize that what Kobe's doing at the national level is uh, forging partnerships and relationships with the Department of Veterans Affairs, with the Department of Defense. We're looking at the Department of Education, work around um, crediting uh, AmeriCorps training. So there's a lot of uh, work being done at the national level to try to help pave the way at the state and local level. We know it takes a long time to trickle down, but we're kind of coming at it from both ends, from the bottom up and the top down. Why don't we move now to questions? I know we've got lots of dialogue going on in the box, but if there are any specific questions, would you, um, could we open the line for those, or how would you like to do that, Deb? 
Well, Marty, we've got about three really good questions that came in with our registration that I thought we could try to answer or give a bit of information for our participants. And Crystal Shanley from an RSVP program in Kent, Ohio, had asked about using the current RSVP grant measures and guidelines, how might we best utilize our veteran population? Kobe? Um, uh, using the current performance measures. So there's so the, the actual the actual current performance measures are there's actually only two. Uh, they are changing in this next notice of funding opportunity. And you will also see the changes integrated in this the upcoming senior core notice of funding opportunity as well as the guide the the constituency program guidance from AmeriCorps Vista. So the only two that are currently codified are the number of veteran and, and veterans and military family members that are in your programs, that are serving in your programs. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be serving veterans and military family members. They, they're literally just just serving and leading. So a great example of that where, uh, where we find that veterans and military family members in particular, veterans in particular, are great assets or resources to be members themselves is in the disaster service area. One of our AmeriCorps VISTA members <clears throat> in Rockaway, New York, uh, was actually one of the first responders after Hurricane Sandy, helped establish uh, uh, a, uh, a service response site um, prior to uh, anybody getting there to include the Red Cross uh, and the first disaster responders, um, and eventually managed uh, over 2,000 local community volunteers uh, by using uh, local teams of veterans and even teams of veterans that came uh, from around the country to do, uh, you know, gutting and clean out in, in Hurricane Sandy. Great example of, of how a veteran's experience and uh, leadership abilities can be used in a very chaotic environment uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, provide a very specific national service-oriented solution. Um, that, that service site was eventually handed over to AmeriCorps in Triple C, uh, and, um, and they're also uh, doing the same thing in, uh, in Texas, West Texas, right now. So that's an example for, uh, of, of one program model that would meet the performance measure of a veteran engaged in service, but not necessarily serving veterans. The other performance measure is uh, the number of uh, programs and services that serve the veteran and military family community, very broadly defined. Um, I would say so long as your program fits into one of those nine bucket areas, if you roll back to the slide that so, shows the concentric circles, um, you're, you're going you're to be competitive and you're also going to be doing what the Serve America Act has asked us to do. And, and I would encourage all the grantees to actually read the Serve America Act provisions as it relates to veterans and military family members. Um, most importantly, because those focus areas, as I mentioned earlier, um, or those focus activities, as I mentioned earlier, will be codified in future notice of funding opportunities and grant competitions. Um, in other words, if you are performing an activity that's not in one of those nine service areas, uh, then it will probably not be as competitive as somebody that uh, that actually um, you know, designs a program around one of those focus areas after doing that needs-based community assessment. So right now, those are only two, um, number of veterans and military family members in your programs and the number of veterans and military family um, uh, program, excuse me, the number of, of programs that are serving the veteran and military family community. Those are your only two big performance measures, but we are moving to more specified activities within those performance measures, and that I just bring your attention to, to those focus areas. Thank you, Kobe. We have another question from Jackie Gilliam. She is an AmeriCorps Debbie? VISTA member from Kingsport, Tennessee. Yes? Excuse me, Debbie. Before you move on to yes. that, I'd like to just go back to this question that um, was asked about the RSVP, because the second part of this was interesting. It says, how might we best use our veteran population? And I think there are lots of ways. We've seen Senior Corps RSVP programs and AmeriCorps programs and VISTA programs use the veteran population. I hate the word use, but you know what I mean, tap into the resource of that population um, in several ways. Uh, in some cases, I've seen folks or read about folks that have created teams uh, where the veteran is the team leader or perhaps it's a team of veterans. I know that there's, there's an RSVP program in Delaware that's actually, it's about the environment, but they're kind of a self-directed work team, and that kind of a model would lend itself to a team of veterans. So veterans serving as um, RSVP volunteers or as leveraged community volunteers would be a good thing to keep in mind. You could also consider um, this is uh, your veterans population and your military families are your source of uh, expertise. They can help, they can come train or orient 
your uh, program volunteers to the experience of being a veteran. They can also help to connect you with the organizations that you need to be connected with. They will know about them in your community. They could set up the appointment for you. Um, they could do an introduction for you, or they could come with you when you're trying to make those connections. So we've seen folks do that quite a bit, where you either um, engage the, the veterans and military family folks as trainers or team leaders, or your source of information and your, your link, your, your contact to the veteran military family uh, community. So um, it, it's an incredible, 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 wonderful resource for all of us. Thank you. Go ahead, Deb. Thank you, Margie. I was going to say, this question from Jackie, um, she is a AmeriCorps VISTA member in Kingsport, Tennessee, and she said, is there a state database on active military or do you have to see your local VA? Um, sure, so this is Kobe. I wasn't quite sure what the um, the, the context of that question was. Um, if, the, if the question is, is how do you find um, the, uh, the veteran population, and I'm not sure if that's the question or not, but um, if that's the question, uh, there, there, isn't, there isn't a master list of all veterans um, in, in, in the states. Um, the closest you're going to get to that, depending upon how sophisticated your State Department of Veterans Affairs is your State Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, uh, this actual most some do some know this and some don't, but the state every state department of veterans affairs actually has access and is given a report of all of the returning service members uh, you know coming to their states annually uh, from the Department of Defense. And uh, some of them have uh, integrated that report into their activities and some have not used it at all, and some don't even know it exists. But I would start with your State Department of Veterans Affairs if you're actually trying to figure out where the veterans are and how to touch them. Um, and then I would also direct people to, uh, your your uh, county veteran service officers, uh, CVSOs, um, in, and these are very localized resources, but every state has them, and uh, most states have uh, a significant number of them, and they're county-based, uh, and uh, they are task-organized sometimes the State Department of Veterans Affairs, and they also have ready access and, and, uh, and know where veterans in your communities are. Um, if you just are interested in a very general description of the veteran population, uh, then you're going to want, and, and maybe some demographic uh, uh, analysis of the veteran population in your state, um, you know, who they are, uh, how old are they, uh, where are they located, uh, the sex, um, you know, their, uh, uh, their sex and, and uh, uh, very general information about their needs. You're going to want to go to um, uh, va.gov forward slash vetpop, and that's uh, I'll put it in the in the uh, in the um, uh, in the window there, but uh, VA.gov has a uh, an entire organization that that uh, works on veteran demographics, and it's called VetPOP. Um, I'll also, strongly encourage you to get in touch with your local uh, ISFACs. Uh, this is uh, Inter-Service Family Assistance uh, Committees. Um, they're in every single state, and uh, they're supported by your National Guard. So you'll find them in your state National Guard unit. Uh, more specifically in your family support, the family support area of your National Guard unit. And uh, for, uh, for folks that understand military speak, that's your, uh, your S1 shop uh, or, your, or your one shop. And uh, they're now, this year they were renamed to Joining Community Forces uh, Organizations. And, uh, but some people still refer to them as ISFACs, and, and uh, that's also a great resource to be able to touch the, uh, the returning service members. Um, now, they, they do serve Guard, Reserve, and Active Components, although it is a National Guard resource, so uh, they'll have the, the widest net network of uh, connections with the National Guard and, and Reserve component in your state. Thank you, Kobe, very much. Um, we have one last question on training that um, Cindy thought she could answer, but what I think I'll do since our time has gone over is see if I can get Cindy to answer that via email, and I'll include that in our chat and um, post that on the Knowledge Network for you. Um, so with that said, I want to thank our presenters, Margie, Kobe, and Cynthia, and thank all our attendees today for their time and attention. Um, 
uh, like we said, this discussion is going on in different places on our Veterans and Military Families Knowledge Network. Their um, link here is right here on your web, um, on your screen that you can see. And we put our information about upcoming webinars on this. Our recording from this session will be here um, as soon as we get the closed captioning up and we will provide a transcript with it as well. And there's a lot of other discussion areas that you can jump on and learn more about, as Margie said, cultural competency, partnering with folks, and even just make great connections out in the community with others doing the same kind of work that you're doing. Um, our next slide talks just a tad bit about um, the next um, session in this series, which is our May 16th session. Margie, did you want to give them any specifics about what's going to happen on May 16th um, sure, before I'd we be close to. for the day? Thank you so much, Deb. Yes, I'd like to just mention that we're going to unpack this part of the and studies during this webinar, and we're also going to have some programs on with us talking about some of the strategies that they use. So I think it's a really, it'll be an opportunity to look at um, what people really do out there, and we hope that you guys will join us. As we mentioned, there will be two others after this, and then I want to mention uh, that in the summer we're going to have a mini-series that's looking at military families, and that will have three different sessions. One will be kind of the big picture overview, one will be uh, looking at spouses, and one will look at children. And during that series, we'll look at things like how to find the kids and what kinds of differences or similarities you'll find in working with children who are in military families versus kids who are not. So lots and lots of great stuff going on, and uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Thank you, Deb. Thanks, Margie, very much. And with that, that's our last slide for the day. I want to thank you all again for your time and attention and also your great work that you're doing in the field for veterans and military families. Um, that will be it for today. And um, as soon as you log out, you will see a evaluation form um, come up on your screen. One is for WebEx, and then the next one is for this specific webinar. We really do um, listen to your advice that you give us and try to um, fill your needs so that we can make each webinar better for you. So please fill that out for us so we can make the next sessions better for you. So thank you all very much. And with that said, we will close our webinar for today. Thank you. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.